this is a film about that scale and grandeur. This is a film about that military achievement. This is a film about a people who for all time shattered the legend of Nazi invincibility. This is a film about victory and defeat. German victory and German defeat. This is the battle for Russia, a battle that has been going on for centuries, a battle that fills the pages of Russian history. 1242. The German order of Teutonic Knights had invaded northeastern Russia and occupied the old city of Pskov. leadership of their Grand Master, von Bach, they threatened to enslave the whole population of that area, including the capital, Novgorod. In their hour of peril, the Russian people turned for leadership to their prince, Alexander Nevsky. And on April the 5th, 1242, on Lake Papus, the Russians met the might of the German forces. They weren't as well equipped or as well organized. In their hearts was a flaming courage, a flame so fierce that it pierced the German army. The victory they won fills a bright page of Russian history. 1704, and another conquering army marched across Russian land. This time under Charles XII of Sweden. And again the Russians fought for their country. Led by their emperor, Peter the Great, after five long years of war, they defeated the Swedes in the historic Battle of Poltava. Invading Swedish armies were crushed and forever driven out of Russia. 1812. Napoleon and his armies had blazed their triumphant way across Europe and were marching on Moscow. The conquering armies entered the city, but they entered a city in flames. Even in that day, Russian earth was scorched earth to an invader. And once again, the invader was forced to start the long march on the road back out of Russia. 1914, and another German army. This time under Kaiser Wilhelm set out to conquer Russia. This time, the Russian people under the regime of the Tsar were not only fighting German guns, but oppression and corruption in their own country. And only the ultimate collapse of Imperial Germany saved Russia from losing the Ukraine and the Crimea, which the Germans had occupied in 1918. Yes, for 700 years, the Russian people have had to fight to defend their land against would-be conquerors. Why? Why have all these attempts been made to conquer Russia? Perhaps Russia itself can provide the answer. Here it is, one-sixth of the Earth's surface, reaching from east to west nearly halfway around the world, and southward from the North Pole to the borders of India. 
one country of nine million square miles. That's our own country three times over, or all of North America and a million square miles to boot. The sun never sets on Russia. When it is dusk on its western borders facing Europe, it is already dawn on its eastern borders facing the Pacific. That's Russia, or to be correct, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Deep in its mountains lie thick, rich veins of gold and silver. Below ground lie enormous deposits of copper, tin, manganese and nickel, chromium and radium, sulfur and magnesium. Russia is rich in raw materials. Her forests cover millions upon millions of acres. One fourth of all the lumber reserve in the world belongs to Russia. And as for fuel, there's coal, ton upon ton. And more important, there's also oil. 213 million barrels a year of it. Black gold flowing from the earth that contains 55% of the world's oil. What else? Iron? Russia has better than 10 billion tons. That can make a lot of steel before it's done. Yes, Russia is rich. Her farms cover millions upon millions of acres. The rich black earth that besides giving forth oil and coal will also grow everything from sunflowers to lotus. The tea her people drink in such huge quantities and the tobacco that they smoke Cotton grows here too, 3,800,000 bales a year, and sugar. And on the pasture land, the animals grow fat for food and wool for clothing. While on the warm plains, the fields of grain stretch as far as the eye can reach. Corn, oats, hops, rye, and don't forget wheat, one third of the world's best. Yes, Russia is very rich. For it has not only raw materials and the products of its soil, Russia is also people. hundred and ninety-three million people. People of every race, color and creed. People coming from the many different republics that comprise the Soviet Union. People speaking more than a hundred different languages. But all citizens of one country. Whether they are the great Russians, the descendants of the first settlers of this vast area, and for a thousand years its main population, or Cossacks, or famous horsemen from the open plains of the Don River Valley. Whether they come from the southwest, the Ukraine, Here, in the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, live the Little Russians, better known as Ukrainians, and beside them, the Moldavians and Bessarabians. Or if they come from the far south, between the Caspian and Black Seas, where we find the Armenians and the Georgians, the Ingush, the Cherkas, rugged as the high peaks of their native Caucasian mountains. and Indian frontiers, or Mongols, the Bash 
Tajirs, from Turco Tartars, the Buryats, the Yakuts, from far beyond the Ural Mountains. Or the people of the ice country, hunters like the Zams, or settlers like the Laplanders. Whether they come from the pioneering wilderness of the far north, or from a great city like their capital, Moscow, where the ancient buildings of an ancient civilization stand beside the modern structures of a modern civilization, where the old Russian droshka still competes with the modern limousine. <laughs> Whether they work in factories or as soldiers, whether they are bricklayers or traffic cops, sailors or riveters, school children or farmers, nurses or engineers, window washers or sales girls, housewives or postal clerks, radio announcers or stewardesses, scientists or typists, musicians or ballerinas. Regardless of what they do or where they live, they all have one thing in common, love of their soil. Russia. Size, the largest country in the world. Raw materials, unlimited. Manpower, 193 million. These are the three reasons why every conqueror in history has wanted Russia. And these are the reasons why the modern would-be conqueror wrote, When we speak of new territory, we must think of Russia. Destiny itself points the way there. Yes, as we have seen, Germany's spirit of aggression was handed down from generation to generation. And now, in Hitler's Germany, the dream was world conquest. To such a dream, there could be only one answer, collective security. So with this objective, in 1934, the Soviet Union joined the League of Nations. Again and again before the League, its representatives urged binding agreements to support by collective action any nation submitted to attack. The state I represent entered the League with the sole purpose of the maintenance of indivisible peace. The League of Nations is still strong enough by its collective actions to avert or arrest aggression. There is no room for bargaining or compromise. But while some members of the League were pleading vainly for the use of collective force to stop aggression, the world saw other members, Germany, Italy, Japan, withdraw from the League to follow the path of aggression. Manchuria, Ethiopia, then Hitler invaded Austria, Czechoslovakia, and in 1939, Poland. First step on the road to Russia, but his eastward march was interrupted by France and Britain declaring war. So the Germans were forced to turn west and in 1940, as we have seen, wiped the last opposition from Western Europe. And while the Nazis were unsuccessfully trying to beat Britain to her knees, the German generals were already planning to resume the interrupted Eastern Blitz. The road to Russia was now open. But before that attack, preliminary steps were necessary. South and east of Germany are Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Greece. And Hungary had grain, rich fields of it. Grain too good for Hungarians when German soldiers have such good appetites. Hungary had bauxite. Bauxite makes aluminum, and aluminum makes planes. And Hungary had an army. Not the battle-trained German army, but good enough to throw against Russian guns. Romania had not only grain, but oil and Hitler needed every last drop of it to power his war machine. Romania also had men, 
more slave labor, more cannon fodder for the attack on Russia. And most important, Romania and Hungary both had Russian frontiers, and Hitler wanted those frontiers in the hands of German generals. Bulgaria didn't have a Russian frontier, but it did have bases. Bases on the Black Sea. Bases for German submarines to prey on Russian shipping. By the spring of 1941, the reactionary governments of Hungary, under the dictatorship of Admiral Horthy, of Romania, governed by young King Michael, who was only a tool in the hands of Hitler's puppet, General Antonescu, and of Bulgaria, ruled by King Boris, always a disciple of German imperialism, all had sold their countries out to Hitler. Now, threatened by a revolt of their peoples, they were only too glad to be protected by Hitler's armies. So by March of 1941, German armies were in occupation of Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. That still left Yugoslavia and Greece. So long as they remained unoccupied territory, they remained the route for a possible Allied counter-invasion. At one of their regular meetings, Hitler had assigned the job of conquering Greece to his stooge, Mussolini. The stooge was delighted. Here was his chance to prove to his people that he too was a conqueror. But he was wrong. Perhaps the uniforms fooled him. Something did. For after the fascist legions had blitzed on one cylinder this far into Greece, the Greeks, in a brilliantly conducted mountain campaign, drove the Italians back and invaded Albania. Hitler was enraged. The failure of his stooge to protect his southern flank was delaying the attack on Russia. He sent a final ultimatum. For the Yugoslavs and Greeks, it was surrender or else. But the Yugoslavs and Greeks come from a long line of fighting men. Nazi slavery didn't appeal to them. At dawn, on April 6th, German bombs told the Yugoslavians they were at war with Germany. The Nazis and Italians launched a powerful and coordinated attack from all their bases, supported by virtually unopposed aerial bombardment. The conclusion was inevitable. Although resistance was determined, the Yugoslav army was cut up into many small segments and captured. The war in Greece also began on April 6th. There, in spite of fierce and valiant resistance by the Greeks and the British who had come to their aid, the Germans, Overwhelmingly superior in both numbers and equipment, forced their way past the Vistritza River, Mount Olympus, the famous passage of Thermopylae. And by the end of April, the swastika flew over the ancient city of Athens. The conquest of the Balkans was now complete. The whole force of Nazi might could now be turned loose on Russia. There was no time to waste, for time was Russia's weapon. Their industries, so recently built and which, like our own, were designed for the ways of peace, were converted for war. Instead of steel for plows and tools, steel for shells and guns, they knew their industry could never produce enough to adequately for the titanic struggle. But what they could produce, they would. At the same time, the army began to grow. More and more men were called up to be trained, hardened, drilled, prepared to defend their land. With the conquest of the Balkans, the Nazis had a solid front from the Black Sea to the Baltic, but the Russians had built themselves a buffer to take some of the steam out of the Nazi punch no matter where it landed. But where would it land? When the blow came, it was from five different directions. And from the north, one extra, just for luck. That was the big day. As dawn broke, nearly 200 Axis divisions, more than two million men, plunged into a front 2,000 miles long, reaching from the White Sea to the Black. Their aim, the annihilation of the Red Army. 
in the decisive battle on the frontier. The offensive started along the whole length of the front, but was concentrated on three main objectives. Leningrad, Moscow, and Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine. In the first 30 days, von Lieb's forces drove to within 125 miles of Leningrad, while the Finns under Mannerheim, supported by the Germans, began a drive from the north to encircle the city. In the center, von Bock's army plunged 480 miles into Soviet territory. One Russian city after the other was overrun by the invaders. On July 17th, they captured the first main objective, Smolensk, regarded as the key to Moscow. Simultaneously in the south, von Rundstedt's forces cut deep into the Ukraine. This was blitzkrieg at its best. The world gave Russia another six weeks, and the Germans issued a communique. The issue in the east has already been settled. Smolensk is the last halt on the road to Moscow. But then a strange thing happened. For the first time since the mighty German army started its career of blitz, smashing into submission one European country after the other, that same German army came up against a country that did not submit. Despite the fact that Hitler's army swept deeper and deeper into the Soviet Union, and by October the 15th stood practically within the shadows of the Kremlin, despite the fact that the Soviet government and all foreign missions were forced to move to Kwibyshev, 700 miles to the east, despite Hitler's triumphant pronouncement, I can say that this enemy is already broken and will never rise again, despite the fact that by December 500,000 square miles of Russian territory, an area equal to the entire Middle Western United States, had fallen to the invaders, yes, Despite Russia's loss of her best agricultural areas, her most thoroughly developed industrial plants, millions of her people, thousands of her tanks and her planes, despite everything, those six weeks had lengthened into nearly six months, and the dread Nazi blitz had spluttered, stumbled, and finally died. What had happened here? Let's try to analyze it. First, in this titanic struggle, not only two armies, but two fighting methods and two strategies came face to face. The German strategy was based on the well-tried Keil and Kessel, or wedge and trap maneuver. One wedge would be driven deep into the enemy territory to hook up with another spearhead driven through to meet it. In the trap thus formed, the victim would be pocketed for annihilation. The German plan in every campaign was to seek a decisive battle at the moment of invasion. A single blow must destroy the enemy without regard for losses. A gigantic, all-destroying blow. Remember the campaigns you have already seen in these films. Poland. The Poles concentrated on their borders. The Blitz broke through. 18 days finished Poland. France. The Allied strength on the borders. The breakthrough at Sedan and the issue of France was settled. The Balkans, the Yugoslavians rushed to the border. The breakthrough came, and in 12 days, Yugoslavia was gone. The Germans planned the same blitz against the Russians. But the Russians had developed their own strategy, one to take full advantage of the vast area of their land. The Russian strategy was a defense in depth, line after line, far back into the interior. And when the Nazi wedge struck, the first line would bend with it until it became part of the second. Again, the wedge would strike. Again, a segment would be lost. But again, the line would bend until it became part of the third. So the deeper the Germans plowed into Russian soil, the stronger their opposition, until finally they faced an unshatterable wall and were robbed of their chance to hit that all-destroying blow they had counted on. The result? The Germans conquered land and lost the campaign. 
But the Russian tactics kept the main bulk of their armies intact and made a long war inevitable instead of that quick decision the Germans sought. And the Russians had other tactics that threw the Germans for a loss. Germany had developed blitz warfare, mechanized warfare, armies on wheels, juggernauts to crush everything before them. But the Russians found a way to drag them out of their traveling fortresses. They used their cities as strongholds and made the blitz come to them down alleys. city was bombed, the more impassable it became to the German panzers. They made the names of these Russian cities as familiar to us as the names of towns in the next county. Rostov, Kharkov, Kiev, Kursk, Smolensk. City after city standing in the path of the Nazi blitz. The Red Army had found a way to make their cities of great strategic importance. Odessa, scene of an heroic siege of more than two months, held up the whole Nazi thrust into the Crimea. Sevastopol, which resisted every attempt of the Germans to break through. Here, for eight and a half long months, the Russians fought for the town, inch by inch, barring the Germans from the great Black Sea naval base located there. And finally, when the Germans entered the town, each district was defended street by street. Each street, house by house. Each house, room by room. The Russians knew their cities would be demolished, but their objective was not to save cities, but to destroy Germans. A high price to pay for a copy of Mein Kampf. So the Germans were forced out of their armored shells to fight and to die in the hand-to-hand -hand combat they thought they had abolished. There was another item the Germans had overlooked. They overlooked people. And generals may win campaigns. But people win wars. And on that fatal June 22nd, when the Russian people first learned of the invasion of their country, their grim faces told of their determination to fight and to die, but never to surrender. They knew this wasn't a question of who occupied what piece of land. This was a question of life or death. This war is not an ordinary war. It is the war of the entire Russian people. Not only to eliminate the danger hanging over our heads, but to aid all people groaning under the yoke of fascism. So the alarm was spread to factory and farm. And from every Russian town and village, men poured forth to answer the call. From now on, one thing mattered and one thing only. Victory. Total war meant total mobilization. Not war just for soldiers, but war for everyone. Young or old, male or female, made no difference. Age had nothing to do with it. If you were only 12 years old, there was work for 12-year-olds to do. Sex had nothing to do with it. If you could hold a rifle, you were a soldier. If you could turn a lathe, you were a soldier. If you could harvest the fields, you were a soldier. If you could handle a locomotive or pilot a ship or guide a tractor, you were still a soldier. For everything you did was part of that total war. Nothing that the enemy could use was left behind. Not a yard of wire or a pound of iron. Not an acre of wheat or a head of cattle and the old men stood watch over the fields, ready to give the word to burn at the first sight of the enemy. Scorched earth. What can't be withdrawn must be destroyed. That meant the factories, the plants, the oil depots. Planes claimed them all. 
the giant dam at Dniprostroy, into which had been poured not only steel and concrete, but five long years of Russian toil and Russian sweat to yield the miracle of electricity to the farms and people of the Ukraine. Now, rather than let the power it generated fall to the enemy, they destroyed it. Scorched earth, the land they had lived on and worked on, their forests, their fields, their farms. They surrendered them to the flames, but not to the invaders. That was the scorched earth. And for action behind the German lines, a new army was formed. An army without uniforms, whose home was the forest, and whose front was the enemy's rear, the guerrilla army. A minimum of glory and a maximum of determination. Their achievements were seldom recorded. Look well at these faces. You will never see them again in the ranks of war prisoners or read their names over heroes' graves. Ahead of them lay nothing but the rope and the halter, but they stayed behind and went on fighting. Their only goal was merciless destruction, destruction of communication lines, supplies, the invaders themselves. Their weapons were dynamite and the terror of surprise. asked for no mercy, and they gave none. This is the guerrilla army. This, the scorched earth. This, the red army. These, its leaders. These are the reasons why, although the Germans conquered land, 500,000 square miles of it, it was just land, barren land scorched land. These are the reasons why, after five and a half months of blitz warfare, after coming within sight of their goal, the Germans were stopped at the very gates of Moscow. These are the reasons why, although Hitler had sworn that before December the swastika would fly from the Kremlin towers, December had come, but it wasn't the swastika that flew over the Russian capital. And it wasn't the Nazi conquerors who marched through the streets of the ancient city, but fresh reserves of the Red Army. people's historic defense of their land against centuries of unsuccessful invaders. You also saw how after five and a half months of Nazi blitz, the Russians stopped Hitler at the very gates of Moscow, and how, in spite of Hitler's prediction that by December of 1941, the swastika would fly over the Kremlin Towers. December had come. But it wasn't the swastika that flew over the Russian capital, and it wasn't the Nazi conquerors who marched through the streets of the ancient city, but fresh reserves of the Red Army on their way to reinforce and relieve the front lines. The 
Russians read this appeal and knew what it meant. They remembered that in their past history, the time always came when they could turn and strike back. The time had come. Their old ally, the Russian winter, had carpeted the Russian land. While in the churches of Russia, men of God prayed for victory against the invader. lines, the men of the Red Army listen to the long-awaited order of the day. The whole world is looking to you to destroy the German hordes. The war you are fighting is a war of liberation, a just war. Death to the German invaders. Fighter command ready. Bomber command ready. Parachutists ready. Artillery in position. Tanks man. Cavalry in position. Infantry ready. Beyond those hills is the enemy. Allay! 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 It was the Germans' turn to fight for their lives. Now, for the first time, it was the German army that retreated. Now it was for the Germans to learn the terrors of strafing. after village, town after town, on the Red Army swept through the country which for days and weeks had been under the invaders' yoke. I don't 
dwellers, out of the forests, out of only they know what hiding places, come the men and the women and the children that had once called these towns home. Soldiers and guerrillas find wives and mothers. Friends are reunited. There is thanksgiving in their streets, thanksgiving in their hearts. But there is also something else, something they will never forget. Their ruined homes, the shattered towns they once had known as thriving and prosperous communities. They stand gutted now, ghostly relics of what they once had been. Nothing has been spared. This was a museum, the former home of Peter Tchaikovsky, a man who wrote music for Russia. Music that sought the heart of his own people. And because it found that heart, it found the hearts of people everywhere. His piano concerto. The Fifth Symphony. Sixth Symphony. His work was, is, and always will be inspiration to countless millions. But it brought only one inspiration to the Nazis. Vandalism. This was the home of Leo Tolstoy, the author of the immortal novel, War and Peace. His home, too, was a museum, until the Germans came. And this is Tolstoy's grave. If the Nazis buried nearby had read his famous book, they would have learned their fate beforehand. But there were other dead the Nazis didn't bury. Russian dead. They weren't soldiers, and they weren't killed in battle. aren't dogs. These are children. Mass murder by orders of the high command. And there were other children, perhaps more fortunate, perhaps less. Young girls, but not young now. The attentions of the Nazi soldiers aged them very quickly. And whoever resisted the invaders met with this. These are the things the Russians can never forget. These are the things the Russians will never forget. These are the reasons why every Russian pledged his life to uphold this sacred oath.
the reason the Russians smashed on, deeper and deeper, along the entire front from Rostov to Leningrad. Nowhere could the tide of Russian pressure be stopped. And by spring of 1942, this area was delivered from the Germans. But this was not the important result. Not that this town or that village was retaken, but that the whole legend of Nazi invincibility had been shattered. German armies could retreat too. German armies could be defeated. German troops could be captured. Besides this crushing offensive, there was another factor that shattered the legend of Nazi invincibility. That factor, which will live forever in the history of this war, was written by the people of this city. A city now called Leningrad after the leader of the Russian Revolution, Lenin, and which before that was called Petrograd in honor of its founder, Peter the Great. A city which today, with the exception of Moscow, is the most important center in the Soviet Union because some of Russia's largest industries are centered here and also because it is Russia's principal port on the Baltic Sea and the base for its Baltic fleet. Here, as throughout the Soviet Union, on June 22nd, word came of the attack. But here, the city was only a few miles from German lines. And while the men of the Red Army and the Baltic Fleet moved out to meet the enemy, behind them another army was formed. An army whose weapons were shovels instead of rifles. An army of men. An army of women. An army of children. Feverishly, they dug the trenches, threw up barricades, built defenses, prepared themselves for the worst. They knew that they too were in the front line. They weren't wrong. baptism of fire didn't stop with the darkness. Finally, the morning comes, and the people of Leningrad dig themselves out from the ruins. seem very similar here to the people of London, of Rotterdam, of Warsaw. As in those cities, there were ruined homes, museums, 
and other important military objectives, like the Russian Dumbo from the Leningrad Zoo. But there was one important difference. Bombing from the air was only one small part of what the people of Leningrad had to face. In September, the Nazis surrounded the city and announced it was cut off and doomed. The German commander sent the city an ultimatum demanding its surrender. He is still waiting for the answer. Thus began the siege of Leningrad, a siege that was to last for nearly 17 months. In Leningrad, as everywhere else in Russia, the winter came early that year. A cold, hard winter, the hardest in years. But here, unlike everywhere else in Russia, the winter wasn't an ally, but an enemy. Here, the 10, 20, 30 below zero temperatures could only mean more suffering, more hardship. In the trenches outside the city, trenches of snow and of ice, the defenders stuck firm to their oath to die if necessary, but not to go backward one more step. And the enemy, in spite of all its efforts, was stopped at the very gates of the city. A city now facing disease, famine, destitution. There was no oil for fuel, no power for the electric lines, but the people defied the elements and trudged the necessary miles to lathe and workbench. The pipes froze, water was shut off, so they dug holes through the streets until they could get to water. There was no food, and the whole city went on starvation ration. The factory worker got eight ounces of bread a day. Everyone else, child and adult alike, only four. And to keep the dread enemy of disease from stalking the streets of their city, an army of women worked with shovels, worked with picks in those streets every day, clearing away the rubble, the refuse, the sources of contamination. Bombs from the air couldn't force the defenders of Leningrad to surrender. Winter couldn't do it. Hunger couldn't do it. So the Germans decided to shell them into surrender. For days, long-range guns hurled ton after ton of high explosives into the heart of the city. Leningrad were shelled, the harder they worked. of high explosives, cut off entirely from the rest of Russia, with only their own hands to depend on. Their determination never faltered. Every day, more people died of cold, disease, hunger. This was Leningrad in its darkest hour. And then a miracle happened. To the west of Leningrad is the Baltic Sea, and to the east and north is Lake Ladoga, 7,000 square miles of inland water. The Finns and the Germans occupied one border of the lake to about this point, and in the south the Germans controlled the lake to here. Between these two points was a stretch of lakefront still in Russian hands, but there was nearly a hundred miles between this shore and the beleaguered city. A hundred miles of what had been open water and was now snow-covered ice.
across this frozen surface now went tractors, sledges, carving a road across the lake. And soon across this highway, from the far side of the lake, poured a stream of trucks, bringing in food, oil, grain, fuel, truckload after truckload of fresh life for the people of the city. Too late, the Germans discovered that they had left one avenue of rescue open. the road, but the trucks kept rolling, by day and by night. The lake highway remained open, and soon more than trucks would reach the city, for the Russians were now laying a track across the ice. To the heroes of Leningrad, says the inscription on this locomotive as it starts its pioneer voyage. From the far shore of the lake, it brings food, medicine, supplies of all kinds. Across the lake and into Leningrad, this train is but the first of many. Trains that not only brought in supplies, but that could take out the wounded, the sick women, the half-frozen children. All those that needed better care. All winter long, the lake traffic continued. And all through that terrible winter, the men of the Red Army, outside the city, found the strength not only to defend, but to attack. Time after time, they hurled themselves against the invader, driving him inch by inch back from the city's outskirts. And then spring came. Spring. Outside Leningrad, the snows begin to thaw, and German bodies are washed from their icebox graves. Mute evidence of Russian tenacity. The warm breath of spring is felt, too, on the frozen surface of Lake Ladoga. But the trucks continue to roll, even though the ice is melting beneath them. Spring, as it invariably does, comes to the city, too. But spring is more than a new season to the people of Leningrad. It's a new life. The city begins to breathe again. For the first time in months, the trolleys ran. That first day, it seemed that every man and woman and child in the city had to go for a ride. This was life again. Life for the Leningrad children that weren't killed by Nazi bombs or by the horrible winter. Life for the Russian wax, the women of the Red Army. And for the Russian waves, the women of the Red Fleet. And for the sailors of the fleet themselves, the artists of the famous ballet theater have come to offer entertainment. Spring is here, summer is coming, and Leningrad is still free, although some Germans did finally succeed in getting into the city. But 
under different circumstances than they had anticipated. Yes, here too the legend of Nazi invincibility was shattered against the iron will and courage of a determined people. The citizens of Leningrad have proved that generals may win campaigns, but people win wars. By summer of 1942, new posters were appearing in the streets of Moscow. Posters that greeted and welcomed their allies. Allies whose help was already arriving in Russian ports. Allies whose friendliness had sent drugs and food and warm clothing to help sustain them in their darkest hour. But in spite of all this, the staff of the Red Army knew that they still faced the most powerful enemy in history and that that enemy would attack again. But when this attack came, the whole German strength was to be concentrated on one objective, the Caucasus and oil. The Caucasus Mountains represent one of the toughest military obstacles in the world. Towering peaks rising to heights of as much as 18,000 feet, with only one practical highway traversing them. And Baku, the biggest oil field, is on the other side. To reach Baku, the only feasible military route was along the coast to the Caspian Sea. But the map shows what a dangerously extended supply line this would entail. To make the operation a success for the Germans, the first necessity was control of the northern hub of the rail lines of the area and a new base of operations. That hub was a Volga River port we have come to know well, Stalingrad, named for Russia's present leader, the pride of this generation of Russians for it was their city, built in their time. With the capture of Stalingrad, the Nazis would have a base from which to launch a flanking attack on Moscow. With one master stroke, the Russian armies to the south would be cut off from help. And in the north, Russian factories, Russian farms, and Russian armies would be practically cut off from Caucasus oil, and also from American and British supplies which were shipped to Russia through Iran and Iraq. German control of the entrance to the Volga and its two main ports, Astrakhan and Stalingrad, would be a crippling blow for Russia. For the Volga is the vital artery through which flowed the lifeblood of supplies. Early in May, the German offensive began along a front extending from Kursk to the Crimea. Within two weeks, the Nazi steamroller had overrun the Kerch Peninsula although two months more were to elapse before embattled Sevastopol finally fell, giving the Nazis complete control of the Crimea and the southern route to the Caucasian oil fields. Next, they started to drive further north and drove through to the Don River in the area of Voronezh, then spread south and east until they occupied the whole area from the Don River south to Rostov. This left them in perfect position to strike against Stalingrad. Further and further south, the drive plunged on, and by the end of August, they had captured the oil fields at Maycock, needless to say, first demolished by the Russians, and reached the Northern Caucasus. Yes, the Germans were only a few miles from their goal, the oil fields at Baku, but two barriers still stood between them, Russian mountains and Russian determination. The people of the Caucasus joined with the army to form an unshatterable wall against the full onslaught of the attack. Further north, the Nazi pincers were within 15 miles of Stalingrad. This city had become the focal point of the whole campaign. Regardless of the cost, Stalingrad must be captured. Those were the German orders. Fire! Fire! German guns, German bombs shattered the city into pieces. September 20th, the Germans, after 30 days of grueling and ceaseless fighting, battled their way into the city's outskirts. By 
By the end of the month, their driver carried them through the whole northwest section of the city and into occupation of part of the center, including the railroad station. On the last day of September, Hitler announced that the fall of the city was only a matter of a few days. Once more, the world was afraid a Russian campaign was lost. But once more, the Germans were to stand on the very threshold of victory and still fail. But now they were to meet a fire of fury such as they had never known. before, the battles waged in the streets of Kiev, Rostov, Odessa, Sevastopol, these were all preludes to what happened in Stalingrad. Every inch of the city was a strategic point to be defended as such. At the end of October, snow covered Stalingrad. From the air, the Germans tried to force the surrender of the Russian-held part of the city. At the same time, the battle of the streets continued. were no longer defending their city inch by inch. Inch by inch, they were regaining it. spoke in admiration of the city of steel. The ticker tape brought us breathtaking news. American and British troops had landed in and occupied North Africa. Further east, the British Eighth Army was driving westward, pursuing the vaunted Africa Corps. And in the northeast, the Red Army had launched its smashing counteroffensive. The Germans were learning the real meaning of the words combined operations. Though a spring had been released, the Russians attacked along the entire front. In the far north, the Germans felt the first impact as the Russians recaptured Schlüsselburg, breaking the Axis ring around Leningrad. Soon after, another offensive lashed out further south, bypassing the Germans' defense position at Rezev and plunging down to Veliki Luki. Still another Russian blow fell in the Voronish area, pushing a threatening spearhead deep into the German lines. In the far south, the Germans were moving away from Grozny instead of toward it under the force of the Russian attack. 
At Stalingrad, the Germans were about to meet new opponents. Fresh reserves were arriving from far Siberia. They had been stationed there in case of trouble with the Japanese. Now these troops had been transported to relieve the embattled defenders of Stalingrad. And as the reserves entered the city, at headquarters, the commanders of three Russian armies were meeting. The Germans had fought for Stalingrad as a prize. The Russians were determined to make it a trap. Two simultaneous attacks were launched, one from the north, one from the south. The German armies encircling Stalingrad were now themselves threatened with encirclement. Finally, the two prongs met. These battle-hardened soldiers of the northern army and soldiers of the southern were emotional as children as they greeted each other. They knew this meeting meant the salvation of Stalingrad and of their country. And on this Christmas of 1942, the people of the Soviet Union can celebrate with happy hearts. They have received a most precious gift from the men of their army, the assurance of ultimate victory. Just as in our hometowns, it is the Children's Day in Moscow. It is a happier Christmas this year. Today, there are no German bombers overhead. In other years, the Russians, like ourselves, celebrated on New Year's Eve, but not now. The factories are just as busy as on any other night. The moment comes. It is the New Year. Stop and go them. And at the front, the greeting is the same, up to a point. Stop and go them, Agon! Inside Stalingrad, the icy winter becomes a fiery hell. Here are concentrated the latest in Russian equipment. Flamethrowers. Ice gliders. Used here by shock troops to capture airfields in advance of the main army. Rocket guns. Katusha, the Russians call them. Every last resource of the Red Army was thrown into a crushing offense of ultimate destruction. This was Kyle and Kessel with a vengeance, but the Nazis were getting Kessel instead of the Russians. And on February the 2nd, 1943, after 162 days of the heaviest fighting in the history of warfare, the last shot was fired. Peace came to Stalingrad. In the shattered streets, the blasted ruins, the ghastly evidence of their ordeal, 
the defenders of the city greet the rescuing army of the dawn. Stalingrad is free. The Nazis had capitulated. German generals who had been ordered by Hitler to take Stalingrad regardless of the cost and who had obediently promised that the city would be his. These generals, 24 of them, who had covered themselves with such glory and such medals on the fields of Poland and Norway and France, they now had only their past glory to comfort. This is Field Marshal von Paulus, Commander-in-Chief of the German armies at Stalingrad. This is the man who told his soldiers that if they surrendered, he would see to it that their families died in reprisal. When he faced his captors, perhaps his worried expression reflected an anxiety that Hitler might take the same revenge on his family. For he knew that when he surrendered, Hitler lost not only a field marshal, he lost an entire army, 22 divisions, 330,000 men. These are the men who had been promised that as conquerors they would winter in Stalingrad. Well, it was winter, and this was Stalingrad, and here were the conquerors. When another spring broke over the Russian countryside, the results of the winter were clear. The invader had been driven back far beyond the lines he had occupied a year earlier. 185,000 square miles of Russian land had been freed. And in this winter campaign of 1942, the Axis powers had lost 5,090 planes, 9,190 tanks, 20,360 guns, 30,705 machine guns, more than 500,000 rifles, 17 million shells, 128 million cartridges, vast stores of other materials, and 1,193,525 men, of whom 800,000 were dead. That is the story to date of the German attempt to conquer Russia. In 1941, they tried for Moscow and failed. In 1942, they tried for the Caucasus and failed. In 1943, and for as many more years as necessary, they will not only be resisted wherever their failing power strikes, but they will be attacked, attacked, and attacked by these united people of these united nations.